So it is October 17, 2024. Kartik is starting tomorrow. And we are in Radadesh, Belgium. And I was asked to uh, kind of bring together the discussion we were having about career dharma, about Varnashram with Kartik. And then I also realized that today is the day of Krishna's Rasalila. So I said, oh my goodness, I have a presentation on Rasalila. <laughs> so I decided to, to do that. So to just talk very briefly, very, very briefly, uh, I wanted to look at these quotes. This is from the Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 12, Performing Devotional Service in Kartik. One of the most important of these ceremonial functions is called Urdhra Vrata. Urdhra Vrata is observed in the month of Kartik, October, November, especially in Vrindavan. There is a specific program for temple worship of the Lord in his Damodar form. Dharmadhar refers to Krishna's being bound with rope by his mother, Yasoda. It is said that just as Lord Dhammadhar is very dear to his devotees, so the month known as Dhammadhar or Kartik is also very dear to them. The execution of devotional service during Ujwa Vrata in the month of Kartik is especially recommended to be performed at Mathura. This system is still followed by many devotees. They go to Mathura or Vrindavana, and stay there during the month of Kartik, specifically to perform devotional services during this period. In the Padma Purana, it is said, the Lord may offer liberation or material happiness to a devotee, but after some devotional service has been executed, particularly in Mathura during the month of Kartik, the devotees want only to attain pure devotional service unto the Lord. The purport is that the Lord does not award devotional service to ordinary persons who are not serious about it. But even such unserious persons who execute devotional service according to the regulated principles during the month of Kartik and within the jurisdiction of Mathura and in India are very easily awarded the Lord's personal service. All right, here's a letter to... No, that's not what I wanted to do. It's a letter to Jai Swami, 1969. You have asked about the specialness of the month of Kartik and the answer is that it is a special inducement for persons who are not in Krishna consciousness to perform some devotional service. For persons who are doing nothing in Krishna consciousness, it is an indirect inducement. To take the devotional service in, in earnest seriousness, every moment is kartik. In this connection, there is a good example that sometimes a store gives special concession to attract new customers. But for those who are already customers, there is no need of a special sale. They will purchase at any cost if they know the import and value of the goods. Similarly, those who are pure devotees do not aspire for any concession and out of spontaneous love try to engage themselves in devotional service 24 hours each day, 365 days every year without any stoppage. So the idea is that uh, certain times make devotional service easier. Certain times, certain places, certain circumstances. Of the six symptoms of surrender, one is to accept what's favorable and to re reject what's unfavorable. So in one sense, everything is always favorable for Krishna consciousness. In one sense, if we're actually very serious, there's nothing unfavorable. However, having said that, Certain times are easier, certain places, certain circumstances. Just like if you want to drive someplace, if you are driving at 1 or 2 in the morning, it's much easier. Your time is faster than if you're driving when people are going or coming from work. Yes? So certain times like Akadasi, certain holy days, certain months, and certain places, things are easier. And also, tying into what we've been talking about, certain ways of living are easier. Just like why do we have these four regulated principles? No intoxication, no meat eating, no illicit sex, and no gambling. Those are not spiritual, right? You could be a materialist and do all of those. They're not intrinsically spiritual. However, if you're not doing those, if you're, if you're not following those principles, if you're having illicit sex, eating meat, taking intoxication, and gambling, or any combination thereof, Krishna consciousness will be more difficult for you. 
like trying to drive in the middle of rush hour and still make your plane. It will be much more, it will be an impediment on you. It will make it, it will be like you're, you're dragging, you know, like you're trying to drive a car on just the metal rims instead of the tires. So in the same way, when we do our proper varna and ashrama, then it makes our spiritual life very easy. It's like driving someplace at two in the morning when there's no traffic. So all of these things in and of themselves are not spiritual. Like Prabhupada was asked, do you make more advancement living in a temple? He says that depends on whether or not your mind is on another subject matter. So certain places, certain times, certain ways of living make our spiritual life easier. And if we don't do those, it makes our spiritual life harder. If you're not properly situated by your, your work and your ashram, your spiritual life will be harder. And it, what's interesting is that often when we're in situations where our spiritual life is harder, we think it's due to a lack of sincerity on our part, which might be the case. But it might also be just that we've made our life harder. Yes? Everyone follows this? So where I stay in America since the pandemic, is a, it's a very small, small room, and I have no place to put my shoes outside the room. I mean, if I did, the cat would take them. There's a temple cat. And, uh, or the cat would put her off her presence to me in my shoes. She, she likes to give me presents. You can understand what kind of presents. That, and I don't pet the cat or any. I don't know why the cat likes to give me presents. But anyway... So, and my shoes would get rained on, there's no overhang. So I have to keep them inside. And I have a very, very small room, and the door opens inward. And the place to put my shoes is behind where the door opens. Are you all following? I can't put my shoes on the other side, because that's where my desk is. And my, my room is only like this big. I, I, I can't like, I don't have much choice. So I have to put my shoes behind the door, and my desk is over here. And so I had, I bought a regular floor mat, but it didn't cover the space, and so I'd be like dancing to try to get my shoes not making a mess on the floor. You all understand? And every time I was going in or out, I'd have to do this, I'd have to be a contortionist, you know. And then one day I, I spent $15 and bought a bigger mat. And all of a sudden, going in and out of the room became very easy. And I'm like, my God, why did I wait a year to, to do this? So sometimes there are things, we, you just make a little change in your environment. And I mean, the, my whole quality of life significantly improved because as a, as a good, well-behaved Hare Krishna, I take my shoes off and on all the time. So it's just like this the same way. If you're in your proper situation by Varna and Ashram, all of a sudden your spiritual life is so much easier. The things you were struggling with just kind of fall away. And the same way, if we especially focus on devotional service at times, like waking up early in the morning, like doing special things on Ekadasi, like doing special things in Kartik, and in places, in proper places, our spiritual life becomes easier. All right, I want to do this. We don't have time to do this in real depth. I originally developed this presentation for a Vaishnavi retreat in Vrindavan, and it was taught over three sessions of one and a half hours each. Uh, so we're not going to be able to go deep, deep, deep. Uh, but I thought it would still be appropriate as this is the day of Krishna's Rasalila. And what we're going to be focusing on now is just prior to the actual dance. So when Krishna calls the gopis and he tells them to go home, and then he's, they're playing together, and then he disappears. And then he comes back. So that's the focus is when he disappears and we come, he, come, he comes back. And we're looking this, at this in terms of how does Krishna reciprocate with us and how do we see Krishna's reciprocation with us. And it might take a couple slides for me to get the volume of the music right. So during the time of Lord Ramachandra, there were many sages who desired to marry Ram, but Ram, maybe we can have a little bit of more lights off, if that's possible. Not all of them off, but a little bit off. Yeah, there we go. So there were these sages who wanted to marry Ram, 
And Ram's like, no, I have this ekpatni vrat, and you're going to have to wait till I come as Krishna. So that was a long time. I think it was 18 million years. I can't remember the number, because I just decided this morning I was going to show this, and so I didn't look that up. But I think it's 18 million years that they had to wait. There were also the personified Vedas who saw Krishna's Leela during one day of Lord Brahma and they said, we want to become Krishna's gopis. And they had to wait for another day of Lord Brahma. So they had to wait for another thousand times the Yuga cycles. So these sadhana siddha gopis, I mean, there were others, of course, besides these groups, but who had waited for millions or billions of years, finally took birth in Vraja as gopis. And then, of course, they did the Kachayani Vrat, and Krishna stole their clothes, and he said, soon. They'd already been waiting a long time. And then, on this very night, Krishna played his flute. And each of the gopis heard Krishna's flute as if he were personally calling their name. And so... In the middle of the night, they left their homes and they went out to the forest. And the forest in Vrindavan, then there were tigers. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just like walking in the Radhadesh property at night. It was actually kind of scary. And of course, their family members hadn't wanted them to come. And they'd been waiting a long, long time. Then they get there, and what does Krishna say? He says, go home. Go ahead. Meditating on me and faithfully chanting my glory. The same result is not achieved by mere physical proximity. So please go back to your homes. He says, go home. Imagine, you know, like some of us, we gave up our education, our families, everything, and we came to the temple, and we got we're ready to move in the ashram, and imagine if then the temple president, you know, the ashram leader comes and says, hey, you know, this is not really, just go home. And this is after waiting for millions and billions of years, and they're like, no. No. By the way, this same verse is said to the Brahmins' wives, and they do go home. Exactly the same verse. But the gopis are like, no. Sorry. We're not going home. We've waited long enough. We're not going home. So they start playing and laughing and joking in the forests of Vrindavan by the bank of the Yamuna. And the gopis are thinking, wow, oh, finally, 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 we have attained everything we could possibly desire. And then, all of a sudden, they turn around and he's gone. We have a name for this today. It's called ghosting. Yes. So imagine if you were in love with someone, you, you waited and waited and waited, and finally, finally, you got a date with them, you know? And they said, okay, I'll, I'll meet you for our date. And you're there, and you're ordering the meal, and you're, finally, I'm with this person I love, and you turn around, and then they're just gone. They're just gone. And the gopis went so crazy. They, they started imagining they were Krishna. They started actually enacting Krishna's pastimes. And they're looking everywhere. Where did Krishna go? They're following his footprints deep into the forest. And they found that even Krishna had left Srimati Radharani in the forest. And they're following and following Krishna's footprints, looking where did he go? Where did he go? Where did he go? Finally, they say, if we keep looking for him, He's going to keep going ahead of us. He's going to keep hiding. And it's dark. He'll hurt his feet. So let's just wait and sing.
And as they're waiting and singing, finally, Krishna reappears. This painting, which we commissioned from Anushiksha, is exactly according to the verses in the Bhagavatam when Krishna reappears in the Raslila, and according to the further commentary in those verses of Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. So we may also think, you know, I'm, I'm doing so much for Krishna, I'm, I'm giving myself, but he's not reciprocating with me. I, I don't know, Some, sometimes he seems to come and sometimes I feel he's there and then he disappears again and, 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 and other people seem to make more advancement than I do doing the same things and I don't really understand what is my relationship with Krishna. So I don't think we have time to read the Sanskrit but we can read the English all together for these verses. Sri Krishna had awakened romantic desires within the gopis and they honored him by glancing at him with playful smiles, gesturing amorously with their eyebrows, and massaging his hands and feet as they held them in their laps. Even while worshiping him, however, they felt somewhat angry, and thus they addressed him as follows. The gopi said, Some people reciprocate the affection only of those who are affectionate toward them while others show affection even to those who are indifferent or inimical, and yet others will not show affection toward anyone. Dear Krishna, please properly explain this matter to us. So the gopis talk about three types of persons. Uh, by the way, it was on the first slide, but this presentation is based on Krishna book, on Srimad Bhagavatam, with the commentary of our acharyas, and on Ananda Vrindavan temple. I didn't have Gopal Champu yet when this was put together. So how were the gopis thinking? They thought, what gentleman would call for his beloved only to send her home again? What gallant would show his affection and then abandon his darling in the dead of night in the jungle? What hero would neglect his heroine and show no remorse in her tears? Why, why doesn't Krishna reciprocate with us? Does he enjoy abandoning us? We should question him, but, but carefully. We're going to use paradoxical language. We're going to force Krishna to reveal his own ingratitude. So Krishna now was sitting with the gopis. Each of them thought Krishna was only sitting with her and they were massaging his hands and feet and gesturing with their eyebrows. But even then, they were feeling angry. Oh, joy of our eyes, now please give us answers on one topic. We're just ordinary women of Vrindavan. We don't know much about Vedic knowledge, what's right, what's wrong. We're going to ask you something, and you're very learned, so you can answer it. So they wanted to trip Krishna up. They wanted to make him admit that he was ungrateful. So what were their questions? Who's the best, most honest, loving person? Well, there are three types that we can understand. There's people who show the love of those who reciprocate with them. If someone's nice to them, they're nice back. Others are nice even to those who are mean to them. And then some people don't love anybody. So who are you? <laughs> oh, Krishna, we don't. Can you explain this to us? Who's the nicest person? So what were they really asking? Do you have love towards us? You just don't care? Or do you hate us? We don't know. If you have love for us, is it conditional love for us? No. 
Because if it was conditional, then when we tried to satisfy you, you'd reciprocate. We came here to satisfy you, and you just left. That's not very conditional love. Is it unconditional? No. You knew how much we were crying, and you still didn't come back for a long time. Maybe you just don't care. Do you ever feel like Krishna just doesn't care? They said, maybe you just don't care. And they said, well, that's not true, because you do things. <laughs> You do things to make us happy, and you do things to make us sad. So you must care. Do you just hate us? No, no. You, you often show that you love us. Were you being mean to us because we did something wrong? No, we didn't do anything wrong. So we don't know what's going on. So this is... The, well, the gopis are dealing with Krishna is also how we should... When we're confused, Krishna, why are you dealing with me in this way? I don't understand. We should open our hearts to the Lord. The Lord is in our hearts. And we should also talk to him and actually reveal our minds in confidence to Krishna. All right, now Krishna is going to answer. So again, we, this is verses, this is all from chapter 32 in the 10th canto. This is verses 17 to 19. And again, we don't have time for the Sanskrit, but we can say the English together. The Supreme Personality of God had said, so-called friends who show affection for each other only to benefit themselves are actually selfish. They have no true friendship, nor are they following the principles of religion. Indeed, if they did not expect benefit for themselves, they would not reciprocate. My dear slender-waisted gopis, some people are genuinely merciful or like parents naturally affectionate. Such persons who devotedly serve even those who fail to reciprocate with them are following the true faultless path of religion, and they are true well-wishers. Then there are those individuals who are spiritually self-satisfied, materially fulfilled, or by nature ungrateful, or simply envious of superiors. Such persons will not love even those who love them. What to speak of those who are inimical? So Krishna took the three categories of the gopis and expanded it into nine. Then Krishna's looking very sweetly at the gopis with his sidelong glance. And he's speaking actually with a little humor just to give them some rasa that could revive a person from death because the gopis had actually been almost dead in his absence. Okay, so we're going to now look at these nine types that Krishna explained. Now, as we go through these, I'm sure that you, we can all get some insight about our own relationships even in this world and our own relationships with Krishna. He says, if people just reciprocate what they get, no friendship. That's not actually friendship. They wouldn't do anything unless they thought they'd get something back. They're just merchants who said, I don't want to be a merchant. Famous devotee, Prahlad Maharaj. Here Krishna says, there's no love. There's no love. When you go to buy something from a store, is there love? No. In fact, you're trying to get a good deal. The shopkeeper is thinking, I'm going to make a lot of profit from this person. And the shopper is thinking, I'm going to buy something on sale. Am I correct? No? Well, if you love the shopkeeper and you're buying because you love them, they're your, you know, your cousin or something. And you could actually get a better deal someplace else. But because they're your cousin, you want to shop there and give them your business. No, but if you, if you buy something yeah, but you're still, you're still, is there love for the shopkeeper? You see? Because it, does the shopkeeper really love the customers? I mean, less like they're your cousin or you're something. You know, age. But usually not. Usually they're thinking, you know, how can I charge the customer the most amount of money that they're willing to pay for this product? And the customer's thinking, how can I pay the least amount of money? Am I correct? 
And when you buy something on sale, you don't go to the shopkeeper and say, are you going to be okay if I only spend this much money? Is your business going to fail? <laughs> right? This is really heavy, folks. There's no permanent dharma, no prema, no friendship, no happiness, no religiousness. Do we have any relationships like this with other people where we're keeping score? There was this very famous book about relationships between men and women, very famous bestseller, and the author talked about how people keep score in a relationship. Okay, you brought me flowers, I give you so many points for that. You know, you mowed the lawn, I give you so many points for that. You made a nice dinner, I give you so many points for that, that people are keeping score. How do we know we're keeping score? Because when we don't get back what we think we deserve, we become offended. You can say, I don't have a merchant relationship with my husband, with my kid, with the temple president, with my friend, but if they don't give us the respect that we think that we deserve for our hard work, if they don't show acknowledgement for what we've done, if we don't get that, we think, you know, then we don't, and we get upset, then we know we have a merchant relationship with them. Does this make sense to everybody? That's the primary, we can say, oh, no, 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 I just love. But if it's like, you know, you didn't mow the lawn, you didn't fix the door handle, and I cooked you three really nice meals this week. I gave up seeing my friend to help you out when you weren't... We, what are you doing? You, you follow? I did all this for you because I wanted to get something back. And, and this is, is heavy stuff. Krishna says... Even if you don't have any loving affairs, it's better than if your loving affairs are as if you're doing a business deal. There's an interesting book I read some time ago about the difference in relationships between business and love. Now, sometimes business is good. We're not saying, we're not saying that all merchants should just give everything away and that people shouldn't pay anything when they go to a store. Right? The field of resources is an important field in human society. We're not saying that. But we're saying our loving relationship should not be a business. Yes? And by the way, we shouldn't use loving relationships to do business with people. We shouldn't say to people, well, this is a loving relationship, so give everything but I'm not going to do anything for you because it was a loving relationship and you had no right to ask for anything. And this, this has gone on in our Hare Krishna movement where we'll say to people, give everything, 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 give everything. And then when the person has some difficulty, well, we're not going to give anything to you back. What are you, a merchant? So to be, to be very careful that if there is actually a loving relationship, Everybody gives, and everybody gives. You understand? Everybody gives everything. Not, it's not one-sided. Okay. The next. <clears throat> People who show affection, even to those who are inimical. And this Krishna has two categories. Those who are compassionate to everyone, or family, and especially parents. But this is true in, this is true even sometimes between brothers and sisters and, and so forth. Here Krishna says dharma and prema are lasting. You feel the happiness and distress of those you love even when there's no reciprocation. And one example is pure devotees like Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad was very kind to his father the original child abuser in the universe. <laughs> His father tried to kill him. He's a five-year-old kid. He did nothing. 
and still Prahlad is like, let my father become liberated without suffering. Let him become liberated through joy. He knew his father was offensive. He didn't say, well, my dad didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, my dad performed, my father performed grievous offenses against you, Ms. Ingedev, and against me. But I don't want him to have to suffer. I want him to become free from his offensive mentality, but without having to suffer. And in this verse, Krishna says, oh, thin-waisted women. So that this, this middle category of persons are as beautiful as your beautiful waist and describes your love for me. That whether, whether I'm with you, whether I'm away from you, you always love me. You don't stop loving me. And my lack of reciprocation, which we'll get to uh, shortly, is to highlight this love of yours. And then this is also family members. Now, of course, in family members, this is not perfect. First of all, this kind of feeling among family members is due to thinking that the other person is a part of yourself. You know? Of course, this gets used in the wrong way for abortion. Well, the baby's part of, part of my body, and I can do whatever I want with my own body. But this concept that the child is part of my body, and therefore I take care of my child just like I take care of my body. Thinking that this person is part of me. And so we take care of our family members because we're feeling they're part of me. So therefore it's not on the same level as the pure devotees. And we know that even in families this is not perfect. There are parents who abandon their children. There are parents who abuse their children. Uh, and there are certainly parents who reject children who reject them. Or they reject children who don't have the right career or whatever, don't have the right whatever. <laughs> you know, oh, my child's done something I, I don't approve of, therefore I don't talk to them anymore. So we have parents who do reject children. Uh, but generally the parental mood and, and the family mood in general is even if your child is a serial killer and is in prison, you still love them. You still care about them. I remember reading about this one chief of police who discovered that the serial killer they were chasing was his own son. And he says, as the police chief, I'm very happy he's in jail, but as the father, my heart is broken. Then there's ungrateful people. So here Krishna has a whole lot of categories. Here he has altogether six categories. Though so there's the Atma Arama, the self-satisfied. So this is, they're liberated. Like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you have no need to depend on any other living being. So they're already satisfied spiritually, and they may seem that they don't care. But actually, they just have no needs to fulfill. They, they're already spiritually satisfied. So they're just kind of indifferent to everyone. Like Marj Rasabde, we were talking about the other day at the end of his pastimes, where people threw poop and urine on him, and he just didn't care, you know. So he didn't say, did I lose it? Right? And he just didn't care what anybody thought of him. And he kind of, or Judd bought it in his third life, where he just really didn't have a loving relationship with his parents or his siblings. You know, he pretended to be deaf, dumb, blind, and, and intellectually challenged. Just, I'm not going to get involved in any relationship because he was an Atmarama. Then there's the Aptakama. So this is a materialist who already has everything. They already have a private jet. They already have homes in five places in the world. They already have a thousand servants. They already have a whole family. They don't need you. And, and they're not reciprocating with you because they, they're satisfied materially. So we have those who are satisfied spiritually, those who are satisfied materially. Then we have those who are actually ungrateful. So the kritagnya, they're foolish. They they just they want to have relationships with others, but they don't see what anyone else has done for them. They're like intrinsically ungrateful. They they just don't know how to reciprocate. Prabhupada talks about you know the man who wants to take sannyas, 
And he says, we've been married for 40 years. I've done so much for the family. Now I'm ready to renounce. And the wife says, you never did anything for us. <laughs> so this, have we ever had people like this in our life? We do a whole lot for them, and they just like don't see it. They're, they're not aware of it. You know, they have capability of reciprocating the love of others, but they're just distracted by their own enjoyment. And they're just naturally ungrateful. I mean, I've met people, even in the Hare Krishna movement, I've met people like this. So many people do things for them. Their guru does things for them, their spouse, their friends, everything, and all they ever, they're always just a victim. They're always just a victim. And nobody, you know, and they're, they're just, completely ungrateful. They can never see any good. They always see the fault. Then we have the Guru Druha. They're actually inimical to those who help them. Not only do they not show any reciprocation, but they actually hate them. Now, it's very interesting. When I was running a school, I noticed that there were certain parents who were just difficult. Like, they were just difficult to deal with. And I realized that every single one of them had been people for whom myself or the other teachers had done a lot of favors. Now, there were people for whom we had done favors who were wonderful parents, but all of the difficult parents were in the category of people for whom we'd done favors, or maybe we bent the rules for them a little bit. All right, the registration time has passed. We'll still take your child. We'd, we'd made some exception for them. And I was so confused and thinking, these are the people who should be the most grateful. And, and, and many people for whom we did favors were grateful, but there was this category who wasn't. And then I realized it's like, if I owed you a lot of money, if I'm a scorekeeper kind of person, right, if I have merchant relationships and I'm in your debt, then I'm not going to like you. I'm going to feel uncomfortable whenever I see you. Right? If I owe you a thousand euros, and I, I'm, every time I'd see you, I'd be like, Ooh, yeah. I don't have the means to pay it back. I'm always going to be uncomfortable. So there are people like this. They've received a lot, but they actually hate the person who's done something for them. So in this category... There's those who have a reason for hate. Okay, maybe someone has done a lot for me, but they also were rude to me Monday afternoon. So I have some reason to hate them. I, I'm focusing on a reason. Then there are those, there, there's no reason. The other person has only done good for them, and they hate them anyway. They envy them, they hate them. And then there's the worst. The person's never done anything bad to you, and you don't just hate them, you actually hurt them. You, we call this biting the hand who feeds you. So you actually injure those who help you. So to summarize this, so there's the selfish who treat their relationships like a business exchange. There's selfless giving, which are the pure devotees who give to the world, and then family. There's those who are indifferent. And here we have the self-satisfied spiritualist, the materialist who already has their desires fulfilled, the ungrateful person just because they are a fool. Then those who are inimical, who hate with a cause, who hate without a cause, and those who without a cause want to harm. Now, it is important to point out that we cannot artificially act on this platform, which is obviously the best. So if we actually have this merchant mentality and we pretend that we don't, then that means we're actually keeping score without realizing it. Everybody clear on this? I, mean, I talked about this the other day. Remember I talked about the, the wife who exploded after 10 years? of suppressing all of her resentment 
and just destroyed the marriage and it couldn't be repaired. So if we're actually keeping score, we cannot pretend that we're giving selflessly. That, that we can't do. But we can do this at least. We can establish family relationships. They're not entirely selfless. They're not entirely stable. But they're better than this. So we can establish, again, and we're not saying we shouldn't have businesses that act as businesses, but within our family, within our friends, within our devotee community, we should actually try to set up situations like a family. That means I'm there for you and you're there for me. So there are some expectations in a family relationship, unlike pure devotees who have no expectations at all. However, we, although there's expectations, there's not scorekeeping. Is, is that kind of clear? Like if, if you go to eat at your grandma's and you say, okay, how much do I owe you for this meal, 300 euros? It would actually be an insult. You follow? Yes? Now, why can we not imitate the pure devotees? Why is it that the pure devotees can give and give and give and give and give without any kind of expectation at all? That is because the pure devotees are feeling this connection with Krishna whose own pranam adab pranam idam, he's unlimited. And because Krishna's unlimited, when I'm connected with the unlimited, I also feel this unlimitedness, which Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati quotes, or explains in his commentary to the first verse of the Shikshastaka, Anandam Bhudivardhanam, an expanding ocean of happiness. He says, although we're finite, when we're connected to the infinite, we have an infinite source of happiness. You know, in the Bible, David says, my cup floweth over. So the, the, my way of kind of metaphorically explaining this, it's like in our heart, there's a spring. You know what a spring is with water that comes from under the ground? Not a, not a metal spring in a machine. But, you know, a spring of water that comes from under the ground, and it keeps flowing. In America, we have a park where there's a, a spring like this called Old Faithful because it always shoots up water. So we have this spring. We're connected to the Lord. That's this unlimited source of, of love and happiness in our heart. But our envy, our fear, our greed, our desire to be a controller of this world is like a stopper. It's like, you know, in a sink you can put a stopper to keep the water from going down. So this is like a stopper to keep the water from coming up. You know, we've, we've, we've like plugged it with this stuff. And when you remove just even a little bit of this, right, then, then we start experiencing Krishna's love. And when this stopper is actually removed, we're so full to overflowing that we can just give. Therefore, Krishna says, such a person has no need to depend on any other living being because we're being filled constantly and overflowing constantly, we can give without any thought of reciprocation from anybody else. We generally don't need anything from anyone else because we're always being full. So therefore, we're, we are in Atmarama, but not being an impersonalist Atmarama, being a Bhakti Atmarama, and being in Mahaprabhu's movement Atmarama, we can be one who's always giving. But unless we're being filled like that, we can't do that. We'll try to give from our own stock. Clear? And our own stock is limited. It's like if I try to power something from my phone. So, you know, my phone can give battery to other devices. I'm sure many of you have a phone that can also charge other devices. But if my phone's not plugged, then my battery will wear out and I have to recharge it. If my phone's plugged into the electrical socket, then I can use my phone to charge your device unlimitedly. So if we're not plugged in and we try to just give, we, we have to recharge ourselves. It won't work. It won't work and we'll, we'll become resentful. But at least we can do this and we can work on this and when we're, resent, when we're resentful, we can understand it's really not the fault of the other party. The problem is that I have a merchant mentality. Can you all follow that? So instead of feeling, 
I gave this, 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 I gave this. What did you do for me? It's your problem. I can think, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm thinking like that, I have a merchant mentality. Now, that doesn't mean that we should throw our pearls before swine, as Jesus says. That doesn't mean we should preach the glories of the holy name to the faithless. That's an offense. It doesn't mean that. If we see that someone's not able to take what we have to give, then we go someplace else. If you go someplace, like, like Mahaprabhu would say, you know, I'm going someplace where people want to buy what I have to sell. And we should be very, very careful that we're not in these categories. That we don't see what others do for us. Or that we have hatred or injury for those who help us. We should make an effort to actually be aware of what others do for us. This is one of the items of like practical humility. Practical humi humility includes gratitude. An ungrateful person thinks that they deserve everything. Clear? Yes? Oh, I deserve air. I deserve sunlight. I deserve food. I deserve a clean place to sleep. I deserve, you know. So humility is, I'm a rebel against God. I deserve nothing. And not like, oh, I deserve nothing. I'm Tamagun. But it's like, wow, Krishna's giving me air. Oh, he's giving me air. Krishna's giving me sunlight. Krishna's giving me flowers. Krishna's giving me his mercy, his prasad. How kind the Lord is. All right, so the gopis are hearing all this. They're hearing these nine categories, right? They gave Krishna three categories. They're like, here are three categories. Which one are you? And Krishna answers just by saying, actually, there's nine categories. And they're still wondering. We still don't know who you are. You're not a selfish materialist. You're not a merciful devotee. You're not our mother or father. All right. Which of the ungrateful ones are you? Okay, we're going to look at 20 to 22. But the reason I do not immediately reciprocate the affection of living beings, even when they worship me, O oh gopis, is that I want to intensify their loving devotion. They then become like a poor man who has gained some wealth and then lost it, and who thus becomes so anxious about it, he can think of nothing else. Please, everyone, say this with me. My dear girls, understanding that simply for my sake you had rejected the authority of worldly opinion of the Vedas and of your relatives, I acted as I did only to increase your attachment to me. Even when I removed myself from your sight by suddenly disappearing, I never stopped loving you. Therefore, my beloved gopis, please do not harbor any bad feelings toward me, your beloved. I am not able to repay my debt for your spotless service, even within a lifetime of Brahma. Your connection with me is beyond reproach. You have worshipped me, cutting off all domestic ties, which are difficult to break. Therefore, please let your own glorious deeds be your compensation. So according to the commentaries of our acharyas, Krishna in these three verses is saying, I am all of these persons and I am none of them. I am all of them, and I am none of them, and there are three ways in which I reciprocate with my devotees. Okay, so first Krishna says, I'm not the merchant. What's the evidence that I'm not the merchant? Well, sometimes someone worships me, and I don't immediately reciprocate. Well, that's a lousy merchant. You pay them your money, and they just stand there. Where's my japati? So I'm not a good merchant because I don't reciprocate. However, I am like that because I do reciprocate as people surrender to me, even if it doesn't look like that, even if you don't see me. I am reciprocating. So I'm not a merchant and I am a merchant. Am I somebody who shows compassion to those who are inimical? No, I don't. 
This is Arjuna and Duryodhana asking for Krishna's help. So there's Duryodhana and there's Arjuna. So Krishna says, I, I don't know, I don't reciprocate. You don't care about me, you don't love me, I don't, not have anything to do with you. Yet, I do reciprocate with the ungrateful. Even if you're angry with me, I still love you. All right. So what about the ungrateful category? All right, well, we have the Atmarama and the Aptakami. So as Narayana, I'm Atmarama and Aptakami, but as the son of Nandamaraj, I'm not. I am not Atmarami, satisfied in myself. As Narayana, I'm Atmarami, but as Krishna, I'm not. I'm actually attracted by your conversations. You see Krishna there, listening? Yes. He likes to do that. He likes to listen to us. He likes to not be visible and listen. So I'm not just satisfied in myself. I have some attraction. I'm attracted to you. And don't I give everything to everyone? I fulfill everyone's desire. I'm the benevolent benefactor of everyone. Even if they're inimical to me, I give everybody everything they need. How can you say I don't, I don't care? I'm not optikami. Optikami is someone, right, who can fulfill all their own desires. Huh? But I become obligated. I feel a need to take care of my devotees. I feel a need to protect my devotees. Yes, you can say I'm optikami. I have unlimited self-sufficient opulences. Huh? But I feel a need. I feel a need for the service of my devotees. I give up my position as an atmarama and optikami to serve my devotees. And I'm not a kritikya. I'm not a foolish person who just like, I don't even notice what anybody does for me. I can't do anything. You can say I'm a little village boy and I'm a kritikya. I'm uneducated. I'm unschooled. I haven't been trained. So here he's reversing it. Do you see? Before he said as Narayana, I'm Atmarama and Aptakami. But as Krishna, I'm not. Here he says as Krishna, I'm a kritikya. But as Narayana, I'm not. <laughs> no, here he says, as Narayana, uh, I am all-knowing. I am aware of everything everyone does for me. So as little Krishna, an unschooled village boy, I might not notice other people's service. But as Narayana, I do. But even if you want to say that as a little cowherd boy, I don't have schooling, and therefore I'm foolish, even as a little cowherd boy, if someone gives me a Tulsi leaf or water, if someone says, I want to go to the Cinerama, if someone says my name indicating something else, I always reciprocate. So even as a little cowherd boy, I cannot be called a Krita Gyan. What about Guru Druhi? What about those who are actually harmful? He says, okay, I'm I am Guru Druhi because I left you in the forest in the middle of the night. But I'm not Guru Juhi because I came back. <laughs> so for each of these, he says, I am and I'm not. 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 So then the question comes, oh, well, why do you do this to your devotees? Why, why do the devotees serve you and they, and they feel you're not there or you don't seem to reciprocate or you reciprocate and like, oh, oh Krishna, then you're gone. Why? So Krishna gives three categories of devotees. He says, for those who are aspiring to be devotees but haven't yet achieved prema, he says, I don't respond to make their worship more perfect by keeping myself separate. They become humble. They'll think everything I've done has been useless because I'm just an offender. I couldn't get any mercy. I'm unfortunate. I'm thinking like this, bhakti grows stronger because gratitude and love can only come when you have humility. The opposite of humility is entitlement. You cannot love 
with a sense of entitlement. It's impossible. He says, seeing them suffer in lonely places, Krishna is saying, I endure pain a thousand times more than theirs. What can I do? Their sincere prayers amaze me, but their hot tears scorch my heart, and their faint of despair causes me to swoon. Still for their sake, I wait in silence. I endure it all to ripen their love. So Krishna is eager. He's like, my devotees are praying, they're chanting, they're surrendering. I want to reciprocate. I want to reciprocate. I want to reciprocate. But if I reciprocate right now fully, they'll think, oh, now I've attained Krishna, and they won't grow enough. They won't deepen their love. They won't ripen their love, and therefore they won't be fully satisfied. Like you see the fruit on the tree and you want to pick it, but it's not ready yet. Then for the devotees who've attained prema, Srila Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Vasamrita Sindhu talks about degrees of intensity of prema in each of the different rasas. So even there, Krishna is saying, I want to intensify their loving attachment. This is what we're looking for, right? We're looking for love that keeps getting stronger, isn't it? This is why people get so romantically mushy-gushy over old couples who still love each other. Right? Some 80-year-old couple on the dance floor looking at each other with googly eyes, and we're like, oh. Why? Because that's what we want. We want to have a love that keeps increasing in intensity, correct? Materially, that doesn't usually happen. That first intensity of romantic love usually does not keep increasing. Usually it kind of mellows into a, a friendship. The first intensity of love you have for a little baby you know, where you can't even go in the other room without thinking of them. Are they breathing? Are they breathing? Are they breathing? Believe me, I am not calling my middle-aged children all the time, are you breathing? Are you breathing? <laughs> the intensity decreases. You get a new phone, you get a new car, and you're like, wow, look at all this cool stuff I can do. And you're just thinking, when can I get back to my phone and set it all up and do all these things? And after you've had it for a month, it's just your phone. So Krishna's relationships with the devotees, it keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So therefore, there's this meeting and separation, which is also in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Srila Rupa Goswami explains with every rasa how there's meeting and separation, meeting and separation. So Krishna says, thus they become absorbed in remembering me, just like a poor man who's gained some wealth and then lost it and can think of nothing else. So you get Krishna and then he go he's gone. And then you're like... Where is he? And your feelings become intensified and intensified. So those who are trying to achieve prema, those who've already achieved prema, and the third category, Krishna says, you gopis are not like that. You're the limit of devotees. And then Krishna says, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I messed up. I shouldn't have left you. Because there's no devotees like you, not in the past, not at the present, nor in the future. I cannot increase or decrease your attachment to me. Your attachment to me is already unlimited. I can't even increase it by an atom. So why did I leave you? I wanted to show everyone else the glory of your love. And I wasn't really away from you. I was right there. I was just enjoying your, your love. Actually, when we're full of real love, that fullness of love satisfies us. Therefore, Krishna says, be satisfied by your own love. When we're full of this overflowing love, we don't need to be loved in return because we're full with that love, our own. And Krishna says, you gave up everything for me, but I didn't give up everything for you. So therefore, I cannot, the yeya tamam prapadjante, it doesn't work with you. You've given me more than I've given you. So be satisfied with loving me. Then the gopis started to think, oh, the reason Krishna left us was to glorify us. 
He left us to show his love for us. He, loved, he left us to show others how wonderful we are. We, we're at fault. <laughs> we wanted to defeat him. We wanted to criticize him. We wanted to say he was ungrateful, and actually he was just acting out of love. His love defeats ours. And then the Rasalila begins. I thought you would enjoy this on this night of Krishna's wrestling. It's already 9 o'clock or 8.59. Well, my computer says it's 8.59. That clock says it's 8.56. I think that clock, is, that clock is wrong. But if anyone has any questions or comments or... Yes. We see, for example, Kalat Maharaj um, very obviously proving his love through his sacrifice and uh, like coming from a Christian background, I feel like sacrifice and love are very like closely together. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, yeah, maybe there's a different perspective because uh, like for example, also Jesus, like he suffered so much, like it's like, okay, wow, this is definitely love. But uh, like with the gopis, it feels like more playful and more comfortable, that kind of. Mm -hmm. So like I don't know. Um, it seems uh, like more. Intense. Well, our our interest is in following Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is to take up the Vrindavan mood, which is very playful and comfortable. That's our that's our aspiration. And the devotee doesn't feel their suffering is suffering. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, the trouble I take for you is a great pleasure. If we're feeling our suffering is suffering, we're doing something wrong. We should feel our suffering as a happiness. I mean, it, materially, we can give a simple example. You know, it's, it's the birthday of someone you love, and so and you want to make a surprise party for them. And it's a lot of work. You know, you have to gather all the people together and get the decorations and get all the prasadam together and try to arrange to get the person not in that space until the right time. It's, it's a lot of work, right? Or if you have a, you know, you've grown children, you're going to get married. That's a lot of work. Sometimes it's a lot of money too. Sometimes people save for a long time for their children's weddings. But it's, it's a lot of work. But you're not feeling it like that. You're not feeling, oh, I'm, I'm working really hard. You're enjoying it. Yes? Oh, I'm putting up the decorations. I'm getting the cake ready. So it should be like that. And again, this relates to doing things that are according to our nature. If we're, if we're giving Krishna according to our nature, then we don't, it doesn't feel burdensome to us. If something's feeling burdensome to us, then either, my, either I have the wrong mentality or I'm doing the wrong thing or both. So Prahlad didn't feel that he was sacrificed. It wasn't like that. He didn't, he didn't feel like I'm making a big sacrifice. Is that all right? Okay. It may look to others like that. I mean, others may look at our life in the Hare Krishna movement and say, wow, you guys are making a big sacrifice. And we're like, what? <laughs> Just like someone says, you're, you're going without intoxication, meat-eating, illicit sex, or gambling, and you're like, oh, I didn't even really notice. Right? Most of us, we don't even notice. Do you notice? At the end of the day, my God, I didn't gamble all day. I mean, it's not even, you didn't even notice it. It was, it was irrelevant. But to someone from the outside, it, 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 it may seem, oh, you have a, a really, really austere life, only eating Krishna prasadam. <laughs> hey, anybody else? Yes, with last one. Why do we have hate? Yeah, why? Uh, uh, hate is the other side of attachment. Of attachment and aversion. So what we really want to aim for in terms of sense gratification is neutrality, not hatred. But hatred is, it's, it, it's all self-centered. I love those who do things for me. I hate those who don't do things for me or who hurt me. 
I love those who behave properly, I hate those who don't behave properly. But it, out of, it's all out of attachment. If I have no attachment, then on the material platform, I neither love nor hate anyone or anything. And the love I feel on the spiritual platform, so you have this neutrality, you have no, like the Atmarama, they have no love or hatred for anyone. But above that, I love everyone because they're part of Krishna, because I love Krishna. Anyone who loves Krishna loves anyone who Krishna loves, and Krishna loves everyone. But that's a love above neutrality. It's a love without attachment. Oh, what is that verse? I can't remember the verse. Ah. Oh. Anyway, it's a Bhagavad Gita verse. To have love without attachment. Prabhupada talks about that. How can you have love without attachment? Love without desire. Is that all right? So thank you very much. And thank you for, uh, I'm leaving early tomorrow morning. So thank you for all your hospitality here in Radhadesh. Uh, I hope I've been able to do some little service. Uh, anyone who I've offended, please excuse me. And so uh, uh, all the wonderful things in this presentation are from Srila Prabhupada, Sukadeva Goswami, Vishnu Chakravati Thakur, Kavi Kandapur, Srila Jiva Goswami, Srila Sanatan Goswami, from whom I got all of this information. I was actually most inspired by Kavi Kandapur. That was what inspired me uh, to do this in the first place. All the mistakes are mine. Uh, so please take the good and leave aside the mistakes. And thank you very much to Vishnu Prabhu who got the text set up at the last minute. I asked him right before Mangal Arti if he could set this up. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.